I'm going to talk about something that might be a little scary to some of you. I want to talk about the responsibility of believers. You know, it seems that um, wherever we turn, our culture is changing. And as our culture changes, the question is, where are the believers? What are they doing? And as believers, we should be salt and light. Scripture talks about us being salt and light in the world. And, and sometimes it's kind of hard to find. And instead of being an influence, we end up being the ones that are influenced, reacting to the things that the world is doing. And today it can appear that the, the enemies of Adonai are increasing in their boldness. We see that in Israel and the things that are happening there. And even around, and around the world, our country, on our campuses, you know, with, with uh, anti-Semitism. But it, and it just seems that there are fewer believers willing to take a stand. And scripture says that we, we will be judged for what we do. Romans 14.10 and 2 Corinthians 5.10 talk about the judgment seat of Messiah. And that, and that, that we, though there's a judgment for us, that, that what we do, the good works that we do in this lifetime somehow gets translated into the next life in terms of spiritual riches. And it should cause us to reflect and, and see if we are ill-prepared and ill-equipped. There were um, two brothers uh, who were believers, and they would do lots of things together over the years. And uh, one day they decided to go on a backpack trip in a national forest for a week. And they, they lived in different cities, so they, they planned to meet at the trailhead and begin their hike from there together. And after a couple days, they, they, it began getting cold, and the uh, younger brother did not bring enough clothes, so he, he asked his older brother for an extra jacket. And his brother helped him. He had an extra jacket, and he was able to give it to him. And then as they, as they went along further, the younger brother asked for a knife. He, didn't, he forgot to bring a knife, and he asked his brother for a knife. And, and so the older brother helped him, and he, he gave him an extra knife that he had. And then as they continued further, the younger brother ran out of fuel for cooking. And he asked the brother if he could borrow some fuel. And it was at this point the brother replied, no, I'm not going to give it to you. And the younger brother was astonished. He goes, what do you mean? And he says, I'm not going to give it to you. He says, we are deep in the wilderness. You know, we are in the middle of nowhere. And it's dangerous. And we need to be ready for any situation to survive and to make it back safely. He goes, you need to be prepared. You know, if something happens to you, I'm going to help you. But if something happens to me, we're both gone. That's it. You know, you are not prepared to help me in case of emergency, let alone yourself. See, the younger brother was too dependent and relied too heavily on his older brother. And if something should happen to his older brother, they both would have been in a terrible situation. The older brother was not going to enable his brother's lack of preparedness. And Paul, Paul touches on this in Galatians 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, and he gives a word of instruction, really, really an exhortation of how we should relate to others. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught doing something wrong, you who are directed by the rock, restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, looking closely at yourself so you are not tempted also. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the Torah of Messiah. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he is fooling himself. Rather, let each one examine his own work then he will have pride in himself alone and not in comparison to anyone else. For each one will carry his own load. And in another translation, it, it says, for each man must shoulder his own pack. Now, this, 
This first verse talks about being led of the Spirit and with wisdom and gently correcting those that have sinned. And, and then Paul then encourages believers to share in their struggles, to bear one another's burdens. And as we do so, we should have the attitude of humility lest we become prideful in comparing ourselves with others. Now, what is interesting is that in verse 2, he says to carry one another's burdens. Yet in verse 5, he says each is to carry his own load or his own burden. So it's like, well, Paul, what is it? Do we carry other people's burdens or are we just supposed to carry our own load? What is it, Paul? And it could seem confusing, but it's actually two different words that he's using. You know, in verse 2 in the Greek, the word always suggests that it is a heavy or burdensome weight. That's something that is, that is, is pressing down physically and something that is beyond what we can or, or more than what we should bear. In verse 5, it's a different word, and it's mostly used uh, metaphorically as something born without any reference to weight that it's referring to more to our service or our responsibilities as believers, which are not overbearing. And it, is, and it is actually the same word that Yeshua uses in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, when he says, Come to me, O who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden, there's the word, my burden is light. You know, as believers, we are to do works of service. James says, faith without works is dead. You know, works, good deeds, good mitzvot, they're all evidence of a person who has faith. And there's a divine purpose in it. God gives us, gives each of us spiritual assignments and after laying that foundation of faith and trust in Yeshua, we discover what ministry, what service God wants to work through us. And, and that's really one of the most exciting things about being a believer is, is understanding the God-given personality, traits, and giftings, and, and developing those things to do good works. In fact, Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship. Created a Messiah Yeshua for good deeds, which God prepared beforehand so we might walk in them. So it's really saying that good deeds flows out of a relationship with Adonai. And out of a heart that has been renewed, that has been transformed by the work of Yeshua. And that, and that God has intended this from the, from the beginning of time beforehand. So believers do have a responsibility to bear their own load or, as we're saying, shoulder their own pack. But what, what does that pack consist of? You know, first, it's, it's understanding and operating uh, in the spiritual gifts. It's, and it's not only that, it's, it's submitting those spiritual gifts under God's sovereign purposes. You know, that it's not for our gain. We can operate in spiritual gifts, but, but kind of like for our own gain. Because God gives the gifts, he doesn't, he doesn't give back a gift that he gives. And sometimes we can take it and just kind of run off with it. It's having those gifts and submitting them underneath God's sovereign graces. You know, it's emulating the fruit of the Spirit. You know, and Paul talks about this in the previous chapter in Galatians 5. And it's not the fruits of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. The, all the fruit of the Spirit, all those nine characteristics, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Yeah, <laughs> okay. All those characteristics are together, the, it is the fruit of the Spirit. And all those aspects of that fruit can be attained in us. We can operate in all those things. And what's interesting is, I always think that the, the self-control is the most interesting one because it's like, you know, yeah, love, I know what that is. Joy, I know what that is. Peace, okay. Self-control? What kind of a characteristic is that? That's kind of like a, more of a discipline. But yet, self-control is really the, the part of that fruit which actualizes all the other ones. That's as we exercise self-control, we can become a more loving person. 
as we exercise self-control, we can be more patient with those around us, that we can be gentle, that we can be kind. And so, so and, and James even talks about taming the tongue, having self-control, taming the tongue. But if we, can, if we can just do that alone, that is a major spiritual victory, just to be able to tame the tongue, just having the self-control for that, you know? And, and part of that backpack is also spiritual disciplines, developing godly habits. And it's, it's prayer, it's devotion times, having that one-on-one -on -one time with God. It's reading God's word. And that's really the main way we understand God. You know, we can understand God. We can look at nature and say, wow, that's God. And God can speak to us through that. We can have visions. A lot of people talk about visions. They saw a vision and, and they came to faith. But really the the main way God speaks to us is through his word. We can see the history of God working with his people, working with us. And that, and that shows us God's character and who he is and how he is with us. And fellowship, having people that we give permission to keep us spiritual. And how rare that is. How rare it is to have people that we allow into our lives. And no matter how hard it is, no matter how tough it is, it's like, Go ahead, tell me. I, I, I got to hear it. I, I'm not going to like it. I'm going to hate it, but just tell me anyways. You know, and having a person that can do that, to be spiritually accountable, to say the things that we need to hear when we don't want to hear it. And that's, that's part of that spiritual backpack. You know, all these things, it's about all these things, accountability and reading the word and, and all these things, the gifts and the fruit, all these things God entrusts with us to carry and be responsible and all these things God entrusts to us to carry. And, and it's really different. For each believer, it's different because each believer is called to do different things. You know, there's, there's those that, now there's those that don't carry a full pack. You know, like the younger brother, they, they leave it for others. You know, but others can't carry your own pack. In 2 Chronicles 24, we read of Ezariah dying, and his mother, Talia, took over. And she, she was evil. She was just plain, like, evil. And, and Scripture says that she did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and she proceeded to destroy the whole family. She killed all the offspring so that there would be no other line of succession for the kings. And she killed all of them except Joash. And she didn't kill Joash because he was hidden. She didn't know. If she knew about him, she would have killed him too. But he's hidden when he was a baby, and he remained hidden in the temple for six years. Scripture talks about him being hidden for six years. And in the seventh year, the priest, Jehoiada, along with the military, challenged Atalia's rule. And in the end, Joash became king, and Atalia was, was put to death. So Joash had a very special mark on his life. He had, a, he had more than most a reason to be thankful for what all that God has done in him. And, you know, and, and also he was, the, he was the only one in the family that was saved. And remember, he was, a, you know, he was a king of Judah and part of the Davidic kingly line of Messiah Yeshua. So if, you know, the, the prophetic line was in danger of being eliminated just through him. You know, and God, God promised prophetically there'll be a Davidic line, a kingly line, and if he died, that's it. That would have cut off the whole line. So God sovereignly had his hand on his life. And this is what scripture says about his reign. It says that Joas was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 40 years. And his mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba, and Joash did was right in the eyes of the Lord. And all the days of Jehoiada the Kohen. So for much of his reign, he did good. But when Jehoiada the Kohen died, Scripture that says that he changed and he did evil. And he did a lot of evil. So much so that he even had Jehoiada's son, Zechariah, killed because the spirit of the Lord was on Zechariah and he spoke and he stood before the people and he said how the king had forsaken the Lord. And it was just a year later that a smaller Syrian army 
defeated a larger D Judean army, and Joash was seriously wounded, and he died soon after when his servants conspired against him and killed him. And it's really a, a tragic end to a person who had so much promise from the beginning. But why, why did Joash fall after the priest's death, after Jehoda's death? And scripture says that Joash started off doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but over time, he just slipped into careless habits and never got spiritually grounded. He was relying on Jehoda's spirituality to kind of push him through. But there was something lacking. There was something deficient in himself, and it got exposed after Jehoda died. And when the priest was gone, he did not continue to walk in the Lord. You know, he didn't shoulder his own pack. And, you know, and not shouldering your own pack is, is not just for no, new believers are usually very excited. They're it's like, oh, you know, the Lord, this is great. This is awesome. And they're just really excited and thrilled, you know, but it's, you know, they're very excited to learn things for the first time. But it's really it's the older believers who either are not grounded or over time, they lose their spiritual edge. You know, they they. They can rely on their spouse spiritually. They can rely on their family or on their friends. That they shift spiritual responsibility to others. And in time, getting crusty and, and thinking all the time that they're okay. Well, I, you know, I've been a believer of 15, 20, I, I don't know how many years, but uh, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, as I, you know, as I hear from the Lord, and uh, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't need to tell me what to do. I, I know it all. <laughs> okay, you know, and we, you know, and that we can be like that. We can allow attitudes. We can allow pride to get in the way, and say things not realizing the damage that is being done, you know, not listening. And you can be serving and still lose that spiritual edge. And whether we know it or not, you know, we are being tested. Trials, Scripture says that trials test our faith. And if we don't know what is being tested, what part of our faith is being tested, chances are we are not going to do well on those tests. There's also those who take on too much of a load and they carry other people's packs, just biting off more than they can chew, taking on greater responsibilities than, than really what God intends them to bear. And in doing so, we can burden ourselves with guilt. We can burden ourselves with perfectionism. We can get into the traps of, of people-pleasing and there can be a pride fueling our actions, thinking that we need to uh, attain something. But, and it's in those times that we need to seek confirmation from the Ruach HaKodesh. And that's where especially we need the fruit of self-control, to know our limits and know where God wants us to devote our energies. And there's always going to be a need. There's always going to be something that's going to be needed. The need is so great. But yet we can drive ourselves crazy and we can drive other people crazy too. In the classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life, the main character has big dreams. And, but he's also self-sacrificing for the sake of others. And he, he actually ends up skipping college to help his father with his building and loan company. And when his father dies, instead of pursuing his dreams, he takes over the company to help the townspeople so that they don't, uh, they don't grovel to the town bad guy. And who owns just about everything in the whole town except for that building and loan company. So the main character has this, this burden to help families, and he has to endure the pressure of the town bully who really wants his business so that he can have a complete monopoly of the whole town. And it's a big burden. It's a big burden that he's carrying. And in an uneventful turn of events, that's it's really no fault of his own, some money from the bank is lost just before he's about to be audited. 
and he can go to jail for this. And to make matters worse, the bad guy finds the money, keeps it, and of course, he's, he's not going to give it away, obviously. You know, and he's more than willing to help the authorities to actually get him in jail. And it's at this point that the, the burden that he's been carrying is too great, and he loses it. And he's, he's been carrying practically the whole town on his shoulders, and, it's, and at this point, it is crushing him. And his pride and selfishness keep him isolated. He doesn't even tell his family or his friends that he needs help. He snaps at them. He gets angry. You know, but he can't be vulnerable to them. Having a heavy pack makes you turn inward. And he can't take the shame of going to jail and letting down everyone. Of not accomplishing his dreams of what he wanted to do. And he questions all the good that he's done in his life, and he's completely disillusioned at this point. And he, he, he thinks it's for nothing. Everything I did is for nothing. And he thinks it's better that I was not even born, that life is pointless. And he seriously con contemplates suicide to escape the situation. And the irony is that this same person who is so selfless that, that, that loved people and was always, uh, thought, always thought of the needs of others is now completely absorbed in his own thoughts. And he cannot think of anything but himself. And as it turns out, God sends a ministering angel to encourage him and he gives him a desire to live again, his Wife actually finds out what happens, and she makes some calls. She rallies some people together and uh, help raise money uh, that was lost. And in this reversal, the main character realizes that the life God gives us is good. And we don't have to take on a heavy load of responsibility, but that there are others that can help share some of that burden. You know, we can feel the weight and the stress of burdens. And even though we may mean well, it can cause us to be frustrated and disappointed and angry with others. And that we can, we can get burned out. You know, but we don't have to take it all on. God has people and resources available to us if we have the right mind to look for it. That he will make a way. You know, Yeshua does give us burdens, but those burdens should be light. And if we are experiencing a burden that is overwhelming us, even, if, even if, the, if it's good things in and of themselves, it may not be right for us at that particular time. And we need to go back, we need to examine ourselves and make some changes. Now, there's also the, those that carry a, carry a balanced pack. And that's a person, uh, you know, and a person with a balanced pack has all the spiritual essentials. And Paul says that we should test our own actions. As the psalmist says, test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. You know, that we are... We are to uh, examine our own pack and not compare ourselves to others, which can lead to all kinds of jealousies and false views about ourselves, and a false view that is either inflated or self-condemning. You know, when you operate with a balanced pack, you are at a place of being more attuned to see and to bear another's burdens. And there's, there's a joy and there's a reward that comes from that. You know, my wife and I have a friend that we know. We've we actually known her for, for many years. She's 80 years old. And, and she's a believer. And she has a daughter and a foster daughter. And the foster daughter had, has had three children uh, from the same father. And the children are now 12, 9, and 8. And she's never been married, 
And the, the father, uh, and the father is in prison right now. And, um, and because the mother, and because the mother had been involved in drugs, uh, even while she was pregnant, you know, our friend has been the guardian of these three children since they were babies. And, and she has such a good heart for these kids. Uh, she's, even asked the, she's even asked the Lord in prayer, God, I, I pray that I live at least 10 more years so that I can be there for these kids to grow up. That's the kind of heart she has. And it was several months ago that we found out that her daughter had passed away. And, and she was not only just grieving for her daughter, she has been struggling with the kids. So we arranged for some outings to kind of give her a break. And when we found out that the kids were struggling badly in school um, and behind academically, we visit her and we saw that she did have a big burden. And we felt for a situation, we both thought, you know, hey, we, we need to do something here. We both felt that in, on the inside. And so we've been coming over regularly and tutoring them and reading and discussing the Bible. And after being there a few times, we began to see the difficulty she had. And the age gap is so wide that it, it is really overwhelming for an 80-year-old. You know, even for me. You know, it's like, you know, with the youth culture, you know, it is amazing what kids know today. Um, in, fact, it's, in fact, I'll be with them and I go home and ask my kids, it's like, you know, you know what, what does this mean? And then when they tell me, it's just like, they know that? Wow! You know, and it's, it's just amazing how savvy kids are with, the, with street smarts these days. And, and part of it is also the tech, you know, where they have access to websites that they shouldn't really have access to. And she's just not able to keep up with everything. And, and these kids are not easy. You know, there's a lot of dysfunction where they tend to discourage and push people away. And it's just, it's all that hurt, it's all that brokenness that just, just comes out. And she, is, and she is amazed that, that we are still around to deal with it. And I just say, hey, you know, you, you are the rock star, really. Um, you know, you're, you're 80 years old, you have health issues, yet you still keep a very exhausting schedule. I go, I, I don't even know where you get the energy to do that. You know, when most 80-year-olds are just wanting to rest and just enjoy life, you know, she's there... You know, with a, with a, you know, driving them everywhere. She has such a commitment to these kids. And really, you know, how these kids turned out is really determined now. And, you know, we felt that we needed to act now. And, you know, and we're, you know, we're not anything special. We're just a couple of nobodies, really. Um, you know, but we felt that we can't let a bad family situation and a very problematic public school system influence these kids negatively. And they, they need believers in their lives. They need to see the love of God demonstrated. And even though they can push away people in their brokenness, they need someone who will take the time to teach and to train and to mentor them. And we just, we just made the decision to help. And, you know, it's interesting that just before all this happened, and I, I said to my wife, I said, you know, our kids are, they're just practically grown up. I said, you know, it, it would be great if we can kind of like find something where we can just invest our life into kids and, um, and, and just really do something. And, uh, you know, who says the Lord is slow in answering prayer, really? Um, you know, but it happened right away. And, especially, and God is not slow in answering prayer, especially when it's the right prayer. You know, but this is what God is talking about. This, I mean, this is, what, this is what Paul is talking about, that we need to be able to shoulder our own pack so that we are in a place to more able to be able to minister to others and help others, to, to bear one another's burdens. Let us examine ourselves and, be, and really be faithful to the responsibilities God gives us. And to work on having that together, let's work on having that balanced pack and make ourselves available to the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. 
Father, we just want to be mindful of the calling that you give us, Lord God, and to not lose sight of being faithful in the little things that really fill up our pack and, and make it light. And Lord, we just pray that you would just reveal any deficiencies in us, anything that needs attention to, anything that, that we need to be having our, our faith tested, Lord God. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord God, that you are, that Lord, that we are your workmanship, Lord God, created to do good things. And we thank you, Lord, that all that is done in Yeshua. And so, Lord, we just bless you this morning in Yeshua's name. Amen.